Hi, welcome to The Upside. I'm your host, Paul Santanello, and today I have the great pleasure of interviewing uh, Longmeadow uh, State Senator, well, State Senator, but from Longmeadow, Eric Lesser. Eric, welcome to the show, and thanks, thanks for, for coming. Thanks for having me. Excited Thank to you. be here. Well, good. We'll see what, if you are in about a, 45 <laughs> minutes or so. So today we're going to talk about a lot of different things. I, but first, I want to tell people that I first met Eric when he was in high school. Yeah. And you were working uh, or helping Kathy Grady, who was running for state rep at the time. Um, how long ago was that? Was that 2000 or 2000? Uh, that would have been 02. 02 yeah, 2002. Okay. Yeah. So a while back, and um, Kathy didn't win, and I worked with her for about five years on the select board, and quite frankly, she probably would have done a great job had she been a state rep. But So I met you in high school. Um, the question I had, and one day someone said, oh, Eric's working for the president. Not the president of what? You know, that's, <laughs> that, was a, cause I, yeah. you know, that was out of the blue. So let me ask you this. How do you go from you know, being in Long Middle High School, and I know you're involved in politics because, like I said, you helped Kathy. How do you go from that to working for working in the White House? You yeah. know, I know you weren't working directly for the president, so to speak, when you first started, but how do you go from high school to there? Well, thanks. Uh, first, thanks for having me, Paul. It's uh, really fun to be here. And yeah, we've known each other uh, for a long time, since I was about 16. Yeah. And uh, it really does start, actually, around that time. Uh, I was sort of getting a little involved in politics uh, when I was in high school here at Longwood, Ohio, it was on the Kathy Grady campaign, but the real first time I, I kind of jumped in in a, in a big way into the political arena, so to speak, was when I was a high school junior and a round of budget cuts had come. You're very familiar, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sure, with, with that period. A round of local aid cuts had come. Forty teachers in Longmeadow were threatened yep. uh, with layoff. And there were a lot of reasons for why that had happened and why it, it ended up the way it did. But I didn't think it was fair that 15 and 16 and 17 year olds should have to pay the price for frankly bad decisions that had been made 90 miles east. So we organized a, a group, parents, teachers, students, we all got together. We knocked on every door in town. Uh, I think you, you'll probably correct me if I'm wrong. I think there's 5,700 doors or something Somewhere like that. Yeah, yeah, something like that yeah. in Longmeadow. Uh, we knocked on every single one. Uh, and actually, interestingly, the first vote failed. Uh, mm -hmm. It didn't pass because, as you know, these Prop 2.5 overrides are tough uh, and, uh, and there's a high threshold to get them. Uh, to get them approved, but that was its own lesson uh, because we didn't really take no for an answer, put the whole uh, issue right back on the ballot mm -hmm. all over again. We knocked on every door. Uh, again, on the second vote passed, it was a little bit of a, comp it was a compromise measure, so right. it was a, a little bit more of an in-between. And those pink slips got torn up, and I remember thinking as a 16-year-old watching those pink slips get returned uh, and so many of those teacher jobs being saved that, you know, actually, with all the messiness and the acrimony and the friction that our political process has, it ultimately is a very powerful, if not the most powerful tool for doing good uh, mm -hmm. in your community. So I caught the bug and I went to Harvard for my undergrad degree out of Longmeadow High School and I was there uh, during the campaign of um, Deval Patrick in 2006, uh, mm -hmm. got involved in that campaign and when I was involved in that campaign, I saw this skinny guy with a funny, funny name from Illinois, Barack Obama, give a couple of speeches, do some events. Mm -hmm. And I thought, who is this guy? You know, he, he, he's kind of speaking to me, and uh, I like what he stands for. So I read his books and started following him a little more closely. And as you know, because you've been uh, and are involved in, in politics quite a lot, I just started showing up at his uh, campaign office up in New Hampshire. Okay. It was interesting because... Um, you know, we're now watching a uh, political presidential primary unfold uh, now, you know, without, without Obama participating. But um, at the time, no one really knew who he was. He didn't have any secret service. There was no big hoopla. And I used to drive up to New Hampshire, and at the beginning, they didn't even have an office. We would meet up with a group of people in a bar in Manchester and kind of all strategize, okay, you write a letter to the That's editor. Probably you brilliant, though, right? Exactly. All the meetings in the yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get a lot more people. Yeah. Especially when you're trying to recruit college kids. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and as you can appreciate, yeah, we would we would strategize for like the first 15, 20 minutes, and then it would just become a bunch of people having drinks yep. and hanging out. So fast forward, uh, after, as time went on, I kind of kept showing up, kept showing up. When I graduated, I went up full time to New Hampshire, uh, and um, my job at the beginning was they gave me this kind of fancy title, didn't really mean anything, it was uh, Deputy Director of Advance. Uh, basically what that meant was I set up all the events mm -hmm. that uh, Obama would do when he would be in New Hampshire, so a house party, rallies, press conferences, I worked with a team to get all that 
set up. But the important piece of that is one of my jobs was to pick him up from the airport uh, when he would land at Manchester Airport, either from Chicago or from Washington. So we struck up a little bit of a relationship that yeah. way because I never got him lost, luckily. We had some other <laughs> mishaps, but this was before GPS. So you, like, it was high pressure, like you had to know where you were going. <laughs> Um, and I make a long story short, after the New Hampshire primary, that's really when they move to a national election. You know, they rent a big plane, they put all the reporters on the plane, and you could be in three, four states a day. Uh, so they had me come on as kind of like the equipment manager. I, I almost said it was almost like being, you know, a roadie on a, on a traveling band tour or, mm -hmm. uh, or like an, the equipment manager for the Red Sox or something. Uh, we traveled to 47 states over 200,000 miles uh, during that, that campaign and uh, ended November 2008. And I had gotten uh, to develop a little bit of a friendship with David Axelrod, who was one of the president's senior advisors mm -hmm. uh, who traveled with us. Uh, and when the campaign was over and all of a sudden we now had to get started you know, at the White House, he asked me to join him. Uh, as his, the title of special assistant. It was really kind of like the jack of all trades. Yeah. You know, there was admin doing the schedule, handling all the in and outs, handling all the um, paper flow and uh, all the memos and other correspondence. And my desk was 40 feet uh, from the front door of the Oval Office. We shared a wall mm -hmm. uh, with the Oval Office. I was there for two years, uh, eventually moved into a role with the economic policy team. Uh, for the president, but you know, Paul, to go back to your original question, as fun as that was, and it was an incredible experience, I, I would never uh, trade for anything. It just reinforced my feeling that real change uh, in our country happens at the community level up. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen from the White House down, and the president himself uh, believed that and would say that to us. Uh, you need people in communities, whether it's select boards, school committees, uh, high school groups, uh, working to make change in their own towns yeah. and their own communities. So that was what inspired me to really uh, get back home. So make a long story short, came, came back home after attending law school. I was like eager to get my law degree and uh, thought I would dive in and try to, try to help out the community where I grew up. We're about a year in now yeah. and uh, so far so good. Although I'd be eager for your uh, for your thoughts on that. <laughs> You'll get them. Now. You know, and, and I, I, first of all, I always I do agree. You know, everything's local. I mean, Tip O'Neill is always famous for saying, you know, all politics is local, right? And I think that's his quote. But um, because I think people think, well, not that they think they know they can affect change locally. It's hard to affect change in right. Washington when you have a, a congressman who's covering such a big territory, and maybe you see him, maybe you don't. You talk to staffers or something when you're writing letters. Right. So you know, in overrides, when you talk about overrides, that's where the passion comes out because you get to understand what people are happy about, or mad about, or like, or don't like in town, and and those kind right. of things. Um, but in, so I, I just want a little, want a little backdrop. Yeah, that. So yeah. Talk of about course. That. So you've been in, you've been in office for a year. Uh, you had a you had a really nice contentious Democrat Democratic primary, um, and you, you raised a lot of money. I mean, and, and people held that as a negative. And I always told people that if you know, there's positive and negatives about everything, right? So, <laughs> right. you know, the positive is you have a lot of connections, and you know, for people say you take the money out of politics, well, other people spent money on their races too. Right. So no one went in with the you know the virtuous act of saying I'm running without money in my campaign. So, uh, but you did. You, you ran a really um, I want to say organized campaign, uh, right? So you get into office, and one of the things you ran on, and and I want this is where I want to have a little discussion. Yeah. With you, high speed rail. Yes. Okay. So, I you know we we we've heard this. I think I I, I signed a petition or something. Where we were on a select board. We voted on something for high speed rail between <coughs> you know Springfield and New York City and that type of thing. There's the benefits of high speed rail. And I'm going to let you talk about it because it's really yeah. a bigger issue. But one of the things that uh, that I look at sometimes when you talk about high speed rail is, to me, you're going from here to Boston for a job. And I'd rather see the jobs come here. You know, yeah. GE, and I want to talk to you a little bit about GE. Yeah, big, big, big deal. Win, you know, big win in Boston uh, for GE. But why, why don't you talk a little bit about high speed rail, what you mean by high speed rail? Because, you know, high speed rail could be the bullet train. Right, in Japan, right. Which we're right. not going to probably have. <laughs> right. But, so why don't you talk about what that means in, like, you know, because you can take a train from here to Boston. 
Yeah, so the, the status quo right now is there's one train a day, which is an Amtrak train, uh, which leaves at around noon from South Station, stops in Springfield, and actually continues on to Chicago. Uh -huh. That train is basically unusable because it leaves once a day at noon. Uh, so for all practical purposes, people can't really rely on it. It also has about a 75% on time rate, which means one out of five times, or one out of four times, excuse me, uh, it's late. Yep. Uh, so you can't count on it for commuting or for work purposes. Uh, it, it also um, goes all the way to Chicago, so it's really meant for intercity, uh, cross-country uh, travel, not regular commuter travel. Mm -hmm. So that's the status quo right now. There actually uh, are tr train tracks that we can use to make this a reality. The single most expensive element of any kind of rail project is, is getting the right of way for the tracks, mm -hmm. uh, because you would have to use eminent domain. I mean, it, it, it would be a very involved process. You'd have to knock buildings down, clear. That is not an issue here. We, we have a track. A train actually runs on that track. And there is a very active rail corridor, actually, between Boston, Worcester, Springfield, and then out to Albany and points west uh, that we could potentially use to operate passenger rail. So. An example of where this has already worked is Boston to Worcester. There hadn't been regular uh, train service between Boston and Worcester until about seven years ago, six years ago. Basically what happened was the state purchased the right of way from the freight operator, CSX. Okay. Um, so they basically struck a deal so the passenger trains operate during the day, freight trains operate at night. That way you don't need to build new tracks, you don't need to build new right of way. Mm -hmm. They did have to put some infrastructure improvements in, double tracking, improving the quality of the rail in certain, in certain places. There are now about 16 trains a day connecting okay. Worcester and Boston, and I'm not sure if you've been down to Worcester lately, but their downtown has completely been transformed by this. You now have a situation where you have people living in Boston commuting to Worcester to go work at UMass Medical School and at all the labs and all the companies okay. that have clustered around UMass Medical School. So, we, so you see it as bringing jobs to this area? I see it as going both ways. Okay. There's, a, there's a lot of research that shows, academic research, that shows that when you connect a lower priced location to a higher priced location, so in this case, our area, Western Massachusetts, we have lower um, housing costs, we have lower um, uh, cost of living mm -hmm. uh, compared to a denser metro area like Boston. A lot of the research shows when you connect a lower uh, priced region with a higher priced region, there's a transference that happens. So things move in both directions. So you will get quite a lot of people from the eastern part of the state relocating here, purchasing homes here, uh, because it's it's less mm -hmm. expensive. So then you know they're willing to make that commute for getting more property, getting more land. That's going to help Long Meadow quite a lot. That would help communities like East Long Meadow, Wilbraham, Hamden, our, our suburbs. It'll help Springfield tremendously. It'll help boost property values. You also will see increasingly the number one, and this is actually goes to the GE point. GE is moving to Boston and to Massachusetts because they've made a strategic shift in their company. Uh, GE Capital used to be the, the financial arm of yep. GE, used to be the main driver of profits, which is why they wanted to be in Fairfield County, close to New York, right. near Greenwich, near the financial industry. They basically have made a major shift, and Jeff Immelt's, Immelt's spoken about this uh, publicly and repeatedly. They've made a major shift over to healthcare, biotech, industrial sciences, where we're very strong in Massachusetts. So they wanted to be near the innovation cluster of MIT and Harvard and the uh, innovation district in Boston, Kendall Square, all the biotech that's happening there. So the reason I just bring that up is the demand for talent is incredibly competitive. So if we can say to employers, we have trans if you locate in Springfield, we have transportation links that are gonna get your work, that are gonna allow you to feed workers in from the Boston metro area, from the Hartford metro area, from the Northampton, um, you know, Amherst Five College area, yeah. that makes it even more attractive for businesses to locate here. So, you know, I, I've had repeated conversations with employers around the area, Mass Mutual, uh, being one of them, I'm, I'm going to meet with their CEO again um, in a few weeks. They are all for these these kinds of infrastructure projects because they know a company like Mass Mutual to stay competitive. They need to pull their workers 
from all parts, uh, all parts of our region. Mm -hmm. So that's the thinking, you know, behind the rail. Um, to clarify your kind of comment about the, the high speed, it's not going to be a maglev train. Right. It's not going to be a Japanese You're bullet train. Minutes. Right. Yeah. It, you know, that would be great. Uh, yeah. but, uh, but, you know, for a variety of reasons, economics, cost, it's not practical in the medium to even long term. What is practical and what is completely doable, really within the next 10 years or so, um, is a train that gets you reliably to Boston in under 90 minutes. Okay. And that's the goal. The goal is to beat cars and then to not have to deal with the parking and all the aggravation right. on either end. So uh, if we can get the train trip. And for some folks in Boston, coming out here in 90 minutes is, is a cut in your commute or something. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, uh, you, know, you talk to people who are working, you know, whether it's at Fidelity or it's at State Street, who are living down on the South Shore and the North Shore, who are living out you know, in, um, in Worcester County. With traffic, with all the aggravation, their commutes are, are easily 90 minutes right. and they have to add you add on the parking and an important piece of it is you're behind the wheel right. a 90 minute train trip you can take a nap you can read the newspaper you can do work right. uh, I have friends in New York or in uh, or in uh, other areas where they use trains to get to work they can actually start billing they can start doing their hourly work on the train you right. know they they open up their laptop and there it goes so you know I think uh, What's important for people to understand and, and the approach I take to these sorts of issues is there's a future that we can envision for ourselves here in Western Mass and we can envision for Springfield and for our communities around Springfield that's very different than I think the uh, vision that's been handed to us uh, or the vision that some naysayers and pessimists say is our, you know, is inevitable. I think uh, when you look at other areas like Western Massachusetts that have had successful uh, emer have successfully emerged out of the industrial economy and into the innovation mm -hmm. uh, and knowledge economy. It's been a combination of cooperation between the private sector, government, and public policy, the nonprofit sector, and everyone kind of rowing towards a common uh, vision. And we shouldn't, um, you know think that these we're in control of our destiny here so if we make um, the tough decisions if we keep our eye on the North Star uh, and we make those investments in transportation and education if we keep the cost of business down um, if we improve uh, the the climate for entrepreneurship uh, for small businesses we're gonna we're gonna have a very different and very vibrant uh, region that, uh, that both ourselves and our kids will be able to enjoy yeah. and I think you know when you when you look at the, and I, I agree with you, I, I, you know when you look at Springfield, Springfield's not going to grow by itself. It, I, right. I don't think, you know, MGM aside, a casino aside, right. there, uh, it needs more help than just a casino. And 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 that's not a reflection. I'm not talking ill of the mayor. I've known him for a long time. It's just the situation that a lot of cities and towns. And there's two different Massachusetts. And right. I had a conversation um, with a, a mutual friend of ours about this that. You know, you go to Boston and you you, know, you come to Springfield and the, the real estate you have in downtown Springfield, you know, and the, the amenities we have around here, you know, we'd be a great neighborhood of Boston, for example. Right. You know, people would people would rush to come into a place where you can go into play, something like Forest Park or, or yeah. Stern Square or something and have a concert, jazz concert, if that were a district in Boston, for example. And, and the rail is a way, I mean, that's what the Mass Pike does, is connected, except it's total aggravation <laughs> uh, getting there. And it doesn't really matter what time of day you leave. I mean, you, you try oh, to tell me day. about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, um, I, and I do agree, you know, you got to look at things beyond, because as I said, I don't think Springfield can, can grow on its own from where it is. It needs something like that to, to bring right. something back this way. Uh, because there, unfortunately, when you talk to people, and you know this, you talk to your colleagues out in Boston, when you say from Western Mass, and they think you they know, think it's Worcester's Cleveland, like, um, yeah. You know, they right, think you it's could, Des Moines, you, right? You could be in Des Moines, <laughs> and it's the same idea yeah, to them, right? Yeah. There is no Western Mass is beyond 128 as far as they're concerned. So um, that's good because, I, and I think that the when you talk about the misnomer of high speed rail, right, is people are envision a bullet train. It's higher speed, higher yeah, speed, or more yeah. consistent speed, or you know, just right. a. And like you said, the re, it's more the reliability of getting there on time, so that you can time your day and say, yeah, my job starts at nine, I don't need to leave at four in the morning to right. get there kind of thing. Right. Okay. So I meant to ask you this about the campaign. When you were running, and not to go, because I, I have a couple of things, but I just forgot to ask you this. Was it, now it's one thing to help on a campaign. Yeah. It's another thing to be the guy in the campaign. Yeah. Was it what you thought it was going to be? And, you know, how did you find it? 
That's a great question. You know, uh, I kind of thought I kind of knew what to do because I had been involved in so many campaigns and I had been involved in uh, state rep races, as you mentioned, with Kathy Grady's school committee races. I was involved in two presidential campaigns. So, uh, you know, I, I kind of thought I knew uh, what to do. And, you know, I certainly was informed by that experience. But it's a totally different ball game when it's yourself uh, and it's your name and it's your reputation and it's your name on the ballot line. Uh, so that was a, a very uh, unique experience. Definitely challenging in a lot of ways, yep. but also just incredibly fulfilling. I mean, I would compare it to you know working for a big established corporation versus starting your own business. It's yep. sort of the same idea. You know, um, you could work in business your whole life and kind of think you understand the nuts and bolts of a business plan and how how to make a profit and all this other stuff. But until you open up that store, open up that restaurant with all your own like kind of capital and life savings in it, uh, it's going to be a very different uh, yeah. kind of feeling. So that was sort of how I would compare it. Um, I it was a it was a really really great experience. Uh, I really when I started, I basically said to myself, you know, there are other things I could do. There are other um, uh, there's other you know, there are other opportunities that I could potentially pursue. I wanted to do this. I wanted uh, mm -hmm. to be home. I wanted uh, to serve the community where I grew up. And my feeling was, was I was going to run a campaign on my own terms. Uh, and I was going to run a campaign based on my vision for what I thought our region and our community needed based on my life growing up here and my family's life growing up here. And I kind of felt, you know, let the chips fall where they may. Uh, and if I lay that vision out and who I am and what I've done and people think they're willing to give it a shot, then great. Uh, if not, you know, I was prepared to, to walk away from it. And you need to have that kind of um, attitude and that kind of posture towards politics. You, you never want to be in a position where you need it um, for a paycheck or for a job uh, because that'll you know, that'll cause you to compromise yep. what you want to do and what your vision is. And I had seen, you know, in, in Washington, <coughs> excuse me, I had seen, you know, tremendous polarization, like really, you know, really just day to day trench warfare, hand to hand combat. I mean, I was there during some intense, intense fights, uh, you know, over the passage of health care reform. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I went about 50 hours without sleeping in the run up to the final passage of health care reform in March 2010. I was there during the financial crisis and the response to the bank bailouts. I was there for the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, for the withdrawal from Iraq. I was there during the beer summit when, uh, <laughs> when that Cambridge police officer came up. Uh, uh, you know, so I, I, I saw quite a lot of um, red hot political combat. Uh, and I didn't want that uh, in um, uh, sort of in my own endeavor. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I felt like at a local level still, at a state level, where the stakes are frankly often much higher, much more direct, less abstract, much more direct, yep. you, need to, you needed to have a posture where you had a North Star of where you wanted to go. You had a goals of what you wanted to achieve. You had value systems that informed those goals. Mm -hmm. But that ultimately, we're a community and you've got to work with people who might not agree with you all the time and people who might have different uh, who might have a different point of view and you got to work together yeah. to get that done and that's been my kind of approach this year uh, in in the state house I have a great working relationship with the governor uh, work with his people all the time in fact I was just on the phone with them yesterday uh, we're going to be with several members of his cabinet next week so um, there's a lot of things we agree on a lot of things we don't agree on we focus on what we agree on and we try to yeah. uh, make progress that way and I think we need more of that in our politics yeah. less. So were you very surprised to find out as much about yourself from other people during your campaign? <laughs> isn't that, isn't yeah, that amazing, yeah. all the, the, the nice little blog posts or whatever yeah. about who you are and where you've been? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, what well, you do, you do, I was a little, I was kind of prepared for that. But um, yeah, I mean, you do realize some people spend quite a lot of time Googling you. Uh, and, um, and so that, you know, that has its frustrations. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I generally try to kind of tune that out. Um, yeah, no, I know. But yeah, it's but just, it's, no, but it is it's funny. It's great to read about yourself, right? That you never knew something about yourself. <laughs> 
happened. <laughs> Both yeah. good and bad. Yeah, yeah, good and bad, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that that can also sometimes often be harder on, on relatives and loved oh, yeah, ones. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because you're in the, you're kind of in the, you're in kind of focus mind and you're, you're kind of zeroed in. But, you know, a lot of the people around you are, are understandably getting, yeah. getting concerned. My mom was not. I, I we bet used, your mom, yeah, I think she was more worried than you were. <laughs> we used to joke that the most dangerous place in Longmeadow was in between my mom and the community house uh, on election day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and I, like I said, I, I met her, and I think it was on, uh, it was the um, Veterans Memorial, and, and and I think she probably had a more worried about you when, than, than her than, than yeah. uh, you were worried about it. So you represent nine cities and towns in the district: Springfield, Chicopee, East Lamont, and so forth. How do you? You, you got a very um, diverse uh, yeah. constituency. How's that going? How's that, how's that, how was that learning, you know, figuring out yeah. what the issues were? So it is, it's a very diverse district uh, in, in every meaning of diversity. Uh, I have some of the poorest, I have arguably the poorest census tract in the entire state, and I have one of the wealthiest. Mm -hmm. uh, I have some of the most urban parts of the state, and I have communities in my district that don't have traffic lights. Uh, I have um, subver traditional suburban communities, more rural communities, urban communities. Uh, we've got kind of all walks of life uh, and all different manners of issues. Um, and challenges. So actually, in, in that regard, the, the district is really more a microcosm of the state as mm -hmm. a whole than I think a lot of other districts might be. And, you know, I've really tried this year to, to listen. Uh, I've visited every select board or city council, uh, visited, uh, visited with you when, um, yeah. uh, about a year ago, a little less. Um, Visited, trying to visit as many of the school committees as I can. I'm going to be at the Long Meadow School Committee uh, soon. You know, and my posture at those is just to listen. You know, I, I give a brief introduction and then I say, you know, let it rip. Like, yeah. you know, just tell me what's, what's happening. And uh, I think that uh, you That's have to one do. One of the best things you can do, by the way, is let people tell you what they want versus you telling them what they want. Exactly. So, and I mean that. That's sincerely. That's probably the, my first thing. And when I got stuck, I said, "I'm going to go there and listen and figure out what they want and what they need." So exactly. Thing, yeah. yeah. And my and my kind of approach to my first year. The best advice I got when I was sort of thinking about how to approach this first year, what to do, was yeah. a couple things. One was listen and learn both locally and in Boston because there's a lot of people who have been at it. A lot longer, and um, do you have time to go on longer? Uh, I can go a few minutes. Yeah, okay, sure. Because we have mm -hmm. about five minutes. So oh yeah, that's long. fine. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Uh, you know, the most important thing I would would, would be told is listen. You yeah. know, uh, and uh, and learn and build relationships. Uh, and then the second thing was, you know, learn and get some expertise uh, and focus. Yeah. Because uh, there are so many issues that cross our desks that come, come into my office on a given day. Uh, and it's easy to whipsaw from thing to thing, yeah. jumping day to day, and there's a temptation to do that. Uh, but you ultimately won't be successful in a legislature unless you focus. Uh, and that process can actually be challenging because, again, you've got a lot of different uh, groups and, and, and constituents who need different things and you, of course, want to be accessible and do your best for everybody, but you do need to have some North Stars and some goals uh, that you zero in on. So that's been the, that's been the, uh, the kind of strategy. The last thing, and sorry, I know it's a little long-winded answer, but... You're a politician now, you can do that. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the other, the other thing uh, that's very important in a district that's as diverse as mine, as large as mine, is you really need to make sure that your vision, that you're articulating, your sort of top-line goals you want to achieve are inclusive uh, and are things that would really benefit the entire area. I mean, I more than some of the um, senators who represent more denser you know, areas or maybe who are in Boston are really representing much more compact places. I mean, I really view myself as representing a region. Right. I feel like I represent Western Massachusetts yeah. and, the, and the lower Pioneer Valley. And so when thinking through public policy challenges, whether it's education, environmental issues, transportation, economic development, I really think about it through the prism of what's gonna benefit the region that I represent uh, uh, the most. And that, that's that been the kind of prism that I look at at different things. Okay, I got one, thank you for that. Yeah. I got one other question. You're the um, chair of not one, but two committees. 
tourism and manufacturing, correct? Uh, well, it's a caucus. Yeah, have manufacturing caucus. Okay. Yeah, share the So what are your caucus. goals with those two committees, and how does yeah. that, that benefit your district? Yeah, great question. So tourism, arts, and cultural development. We actually have the committee is coming to Springfield for a visit on has January. Ever uh, I think they came maybe two years ago, okay. uh, but it's the first time they're coming with their local senator as the chair. So they're going to stay longer this dress time. Nicer, <laughs> stay longer, <yep. laughs> and we're going to have better attendance. Yep. Uh, but um, uh, so tourism, this is a, actually a, a great question because I think this is an often an overlooked opportunity for us and an overlooked industry. It's the third largest industry in Massachusetts and is particularly important in Western Mass. Mm -hmm. For every dollar spent on tourism promotion, there's a $7 uh, ripple effect in the economy because when people come to the Basketball Hall of Fame or they go to the Quadrangle or, or, um, or they go to Six Flags, they're not just going there. They're stopping for dinner. They're staying overnight. They're, they're spending money in the economy. And these are attractions that can't be outsourced. You know, a company might leave. Uh, but some of our, our natural attractions, our inherent attractions, can't be outsourced. So uh, I think, frankly, we uh, underachieve in this area. I think that there's a lot more we could be doing uh, in the greater Springfield area to attract visitors, to attract more investment. And that's really what our focus has been on the Tourism Committee. Uh, on, uh, I know because I know we're running short on time to run to the Manufacturing Caucus real quick. Again, a quarter of the private sector employment in our area is in manufacturing. We're the home of Smith & Wesson, we're the home of American, we were the home of American Bosch, the home of Indian Motorcycles, the Armory was put here, uh, and ever since then we've been a center for advanced manufacturing. We have Pratt & Whitney just to the south of us. Uh, we have, um, uh, we have uh, you know, Durier Motors used to be here. We have a proud history in Western Mass of making things. And any strategy that is going to seriously address uh, opportunity for middle class people in the Pioneer Valley has to address manufacturing policy because that is our historic strength. We have to focus on what we've been good at. Mm -hmm. And what we've been good at is making things. And what we need to do increasingly is we need to marry up that history as a manufacturing center with our emerging strength as a knowledge and education center, and we need to combine them. And the way you combine them is through advanced manufacturing and precision machining, things like making solar panels and wind turbines and operating the lasers that cut the components of a jet engine part mm -hmm. to you know, the millionth of a millimeter. Very cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, and it's happening here in the Pioneer Valley, except we don't have enough skilled workers to take on those jobs. And these are lucrative jobs. You know, you, you, the median income can approach $75,000 a year in some of these jobs with a 15-week training program. Yeah. So what I've really zeroed in on in the Manufacturing Caucus and what you're gonna see more of is more programs aimed at closing that skill gap. More uh, training in advanced manufacturing, more job training, more closing the gap between our education centers and our training centers and our employers, getting them in the room more to talk to each other. Programs like the uh, Advanced Manufacturing Initiative at STIC, uh, we got to expand that and improve it. And that's going to be the ticket for us uh, to economic growth in the future. Excellent. Thank yeah. you. Eric, where's your office located? So we're at 60, we have two offices. Okay. There's a local office at 60 Shaker Road uh, in East Long Meadow, so uh, people can just pop in yep. anytime. Uh, the little shopping center where Shelburne Falls Coffee Shop is and where Coffee Time is, yep. uh, right in there. Uh, or if people are ever in Boston or want to take a visit or take a tour of the State House, we're in room 519 uh, at the State House as well. So if you need to ever get in touch with uh, Senator Lesser, you can walk in his office, you can Google him because he's definitely there, uh, <laughs> right? We know that. And you'll see all the other things that people do. You can Google it, get the uh, email addresses, and um, uh, if you need to bring an issue forward, please contact him. Uh, Eric, thank you again for coming on the hey, show. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Folks, yeah. thanks for watching The Upside. You have a great day. We'll see you on the next show.